Hello everybody, it's Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso and I have a follow-up to the breaking chain tutorial. I was pretty happy with that overall. It originally started as a question during Rocket Lasso Live, which is a live stream that I do every Wednesday where I answer questions live about Cinema 4D on YouTube and Twitch. But as I was creating some animations for that tutorial so I could post them on social media and whatnot, I ended up improving on some of the techniques and there were improvements that were good enough that I thought I should do a follow-up. Now, in spite of this being a follow-up, I think I'm going to record it sort of as a standalone tutorial, probably in two parts so we can really focus in. Now, I know it's, it's, it's not complicated, but there's a lot of steps to building something properly. But once we have it built once, I think it will just work from there on out. And this is the quickest, most accurate calculation chain I've been able to make. So why don't we dive right into cinema and start working on it? Here's the scene file I ended on last time. We'll be starting from scratch in this one, no worries, but I want to talk about some of the problems with the previous version. The first problem was in order to make these look nice and smooth, we had to swap out our dynamic body for the nice looking final geometry. And in order to do that, we had to bake down our dynamics and then we had to bake the MoGraph, swap objects out, it was really clunky. But after that happened, it looked pretty good. And we have a nice break right there. It snaps really nicely. But we introduced all these vibrations over here. And that's a problem as well. So the new techniques will avoid that. And we're going to get really nice motion from it. Oh, and one more thing to mention is even though it didn't happen while I was recording the tutorial, a very, very common occurrence is once this chain breaks because of the spring, it starts accelerating and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning faster and faster and faster. And once that kind of happens, there's no way to stop it. I have no idea why it worked so well while I recorded this tutorial, but typically it doesn't. And I know people that were doing the tutorial were having trouble with it. So this new technique should avoid that as well. As I said, we're going to do this from scratch. So we will begin with a brand new scene file. In our first go with this, the chains were really large. They're pretty similar to the size of a default cube. And I think we did that because cinema by default likes objects to be about the size of a default cube or sphere. That's good scale for dynamics, but that's way too big. If we're working at a real world scale, you see, if we make a character here that this is way too big. We're going to be working at a smaller scale. And the smaller scale is, it's not going to be the tiniest thing, you know, too big for a necklace, but it's going to be a lot more of a medium size, I think. And that's because, let's delete all that. We are going to create a rectangle and set it to only 10 by 20 wide. A lot more reasonable of a scale, a lot smaller. So with that created, I'm going to turn on rounding. The default of five is going to look very good for us. And that is something we can create a bunch of copies around. I want to make this as low poly as possible. So the first thought there is creating a cube instead of a sphere and dropping this to, let's say four by four by four. I'm going to be very precise with my numbers in this one because it's, it, these are technical. If, if we scale these differently, if you make them a different scale, your numbers are going to change all over the place. But I will emphasize the different areas that if something's not working, this is an area where you want to like try going bigger, try going smaller. Let's just keep that in mind. Now, uh, a cube is very low poly, but I want it to look a little bit like a sphere. So I'm going to turn on fillet, drop the radius to or subdivisions to one and the radius to, let's say, 1.25. Very nice. So it's very spherical looking up approximately the proportions of a sphere, but a lot fewer polygons. The next step is create a cloner, drop this into the cloner, and let's make a bunch of clones around this base shape. Um, pretty straightforward in that we can grab the cloner, click on object mode. The object shall be the rectangle, and that's going to create some copies immediately. And that is set to a count we can set this to step or even lay them out however we want to, but that distribution is pretty good. In fact, I, I do like the distribution of that. The fewer we have, the better though. The problem turns into if we start dropping the count down to say eight, then we don't get as even of a split on these. So then we have to start counter pushing with the, the offset. So I can start pulling these back and finding a slightly better angle. It looks like right around five is good. And you know every single bit of geometry that we can save is going to be a positive. In fact, later we might even turn the fillet off of the cubes. But for right now, I think this is a good idea. Now, a lot of the collisions are gonna be happening on the inside of the shape. So I think this is actually relatively smooth as far as that is concerned. And this is actually a pretty nice start for the geometry that we need. Right away, 
Uh, let's make our cloner editable. We're probably we're probably going to go back to that state later to make our broken version. But for now, this should be working quite nicely. We've got all of these cubes, but by default, they don't get created in the order that I want them to be. I'd really love it to travel from kind of from one side and around the other clockwise. And that is just not what I'm getting here. So if I'm being picky, which you don't have to be, but it's going to keep everything more organized. I'm actually going to manually rearrange all these until they are in the order I want them to be. So that's the third one. That is the fourth one. Fifth one. Sixth one. Doesn't take too long because we have so little geometry. And finally, the last one. And probably not a bad idea to rename these. So I'm going to rename them cube. And all those numbers go away, so those won't be confusing us. And if we are inclined, I can type in one, two, three, um, four, and five, and six, seven, eight. And if we're p feeling picky, let's fix that three. Excellent. A little bit of organization is going to go a long way as we keep on going. Although now I think about it, I'm about to create a couple extra cubes, so those numbers might change a little bit. Now. Well, we need obviously a connection in between these. So let's create a number zero here. That's my way of getting a way of renaming these. I'm going to create a cube zero and we want this right in the center. So first of all, I think we can get rid of this rotation. Next, it's is going to be zero on X. We do that. And we know that this is 10 tall, the rectangle that we made. So that should be exactly five up on Y. So that should be dead center there. Now we have the ability to scale this up and fill in the gap there so that that should close out the top of the chain. And then really simple, make a duplicate of that, rename it number nine and put it on negative Y. And it's at, actually, it shouldn't be at the end of the chain. It should be at the halfway point. So right after this one. So maybe some renaming and numbering is warranted. Six, seven, eight, and nine. Not too bad. Now, as these travel around, they will create our shape. Now we can just, well, here's a thought. Let's make them dynamic. Right click on the cloner. Simulation, rigid body, and... I want these to be calculated not as automatic, but as ellipsoid. The ellipsoids are going to be creating a perfect circle calculation and circles calculate quicker than anything else in cinema as far as dynamics are concerned. So that is going to speed everything up a lot. And then this is going to be one of our static links. It's going to be one that doesn't break. And that means we can do this really simple and change the way that these tags are combined from apply tag to children changing it to compound collision shape. So it's actually going to say every one of these is an individual sphere, but then they all get combined until they're being treated as one object. So we should be able to see this easily. If we have play, they should fall out of the scene because we made it editable. Unlike the last one, these are not dependent on this rectangle anymore. So those can just fall away. I'm going to create a floor, pull this down. And now there's something I can collide into. Drop that on there. Let's even turn on some SSAO just so we can get a little bit of contact shadow and you can see it'll hit the ground, fall over, working well. Everything's pretty smooth there. I like that, it's working pretty much exactly the way we want to. That becomes a single link. Now, uh, being organized in this is gonna go a really long way. We'll move the floor all the way to the bottom and rename this link. That is a single link in our chain. But what if we want some nice round geometry around this? We wanna see the final geometry. Obviously that doesn't look good. So what we were doing before, and we will be doing a little bit of this as well, what we're doing is selecting all of our cubes, creating a tracer object. And because they're selected, it'll automatically be fed into the trace link field. So that should be traveling around. If we hide what we currently have, and let's also hide the rectangle, turn it off. You can see that there's nothing here. It's actually going to be tracing those individual elements. But what we'd like it to do is change the tracing mode to connect all elements. It's going to look a little bit crazy, but that's because it's currently tracing the vertices. Turn that off. And now we can see exactly one link in between every one of our pieces. There's a big open gap there, but if we click close spline, that will close that out. And we have that final link traveling around. Now there is one interesting problem and we'll have to deal with this a little bit later. But if I hit play, even if I go frame by frame, I believe you can see how it's falling behind. So if we don't want to see that, if we don't have to see that here, something we do is just make this tracer editable. And that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this editable. 
Now we've got a bunch of different spline types we can do. This is a little bit chunky right now. And we'll see this actually better if we put this into our sweep. So holding down Alt, I will create a sweep nerves. Holding down Shift, I will create an end side and that will automatically make it a child and then make the end side a child of the sweep as we make it. It's really big right now. We know that it is a size, as it's four units wide, which translates, of course, to two units in radius. So that should be pretty evenly matching the link that we are feeding in. So with that in mind, let's make our geometry a little bit cleaner. I'm going to hit NB. You can see this is our geometry. Very low poly, which is nice, but this is not going to be calculated dynamically. So we can make it look a little bit nicer. Let's jump our sides up to 12. It'll make that a lot smoother. And inside the tracer, we can change the spline type to something like B spline. Give it some intermediate points. I like uniform. We can drop that to one. And now you can see it'll create more even subdivisions all the way around the entire oval. You can increase this or decrease it to whatever amount you want to make it smoother or less smooth. And of course, it could go into a subdivision surface as well. But I'm going to keep it relatively low poly just so when we clone a bunch of them, it'll still be pretty smooth. Excellent. Now, let me show you a neat trick that I only just found out by doing a lot of practice on this. And that is if we make the sweep a child of the object and unhide it. And let's see. Oh, yeah. All these are going to still be here and that's completely fine. I'm going to tell them not to render though. So all of those cubes don't render and you can actually click and paint downward and all of them will adapt that same setting. Now, currently, this will also be part of the compound collision shape and be treated as a big sphere, a big flat sphere that's stretched. We don't want that. What we can do is make a new dynamics tag on this. Let's say simulation rigid body. And this time, I'm going to say that dynamics are not enabled. So this has its own unique dynamics tag, but it's underneath a null that is part of a big compound collision shape. So here's what's cool. If I hit frame forward, it is moving with that collection, but it itself is not being calculated in the dynamics, which is going to allow us to calculate very clean, very smooth, very fast and accurately while automatically giving us the nice, clean, final geometry. Visually, I can hide all the cubes. We don't need to see those anymore. And I can just hit play and we get our link and it's working pretty much perfectly. I say we save the scene file as 2B. I should mention that if you are supporting on Patreon, you get access to all of those scene files, but nothing replaces actually building and understanding what's going on. So obviously that's why I record them as tutorials. So we've got a single link here. It should be working really well for us. Everything is super clean. And let's uh, let's do a couple of quick tests with this thing. Why not? If I were to copy and paste this link, I can rename it to be static link and change its dynamics tag to be dynamics dynamic off. So now it's not going to move. It's a static object. By rotating it 90 degrees on P, it will lay flat on the ground. I can scoot it over here. And that is now a static link that won't go anywhere. I should now be able to hit play. And our single link is going to be stuck right there on this one and just kind of wobble back and forth because it's balanced right there. Okay, that's working well. Well, if we want more links here, well, let's get rid of the, uh, well, we need, you know, I'll keep the floor for now, but I'll pull it down. Let's create a cloner. Inside the cloner, drop the link. The, um, so now we've got a cloner. We'll just call it cloner links. Keep it nice and clean. This shall be a linear cloner. It won't push up on Y. It will push, I believe, on positive X. So we can make these. This is each step. Let's just eyeball how far each one should go. I'm not entirely sure. Something like that. So each link is being created. And I think we want to rotate on P. And every one is going to rotate an extra 90 degrees, another 90 degrees, another 90 degrees. So just by doing that, we've got this very clean setup. I can make as many copies as I want there. Keep this entirely parametric, not change anything. Let's hit NA. Then we hit play. And now we've got a chain that should calculate with our final geometry, nothing made editable, nothing having to be baked, a chain that's going to just be very controllable. So I, yeah, I really like this type of setup, just the ability for this to create as many copies as we want. And it should just continue working really smoothly. I'm going to create a light just so we can get some contact shadows. 
Move that there, move it up, nothing fancy. Shadow soft, this uh, option, shadow. Okay, nice. Now we can actually see that collide with the ground. And now let's see what we got here. Oh, uh, interestingly, that is, seems to be escaping a little bit. So um, where we're at now is we should probably crank up our steps per frame. Now, given this chain as we have it, it's actually incredibly uh, detailed. It's going to be really hard for things to escape in general. But we're still only at Control-D or Command-D in Dynamics. We are still at five steps per frame, which is pretty low. As we move forward into making the breaking link, we're going to need to crank that up a lot. So even right now, I'm inclined to put this up to a really high number, something like 44, like a big number. And when you're doing a lot of your dynamic simulations, it's going to be a good idea to decide what that number is because a lot of the settings that we're controlling are going to be very dependent on this number. But as soon as I crank this up, even a little bit, probably even if we jump it up to just 10, that's not going to fall apart anymore. So if you're just staying with these more basic chains, these not huge numbers will probably work quite well for you. So very nice chain here. We And let's just uh, stress test this a little bit. It's looking really good. In fact, we can save it one more time to see. What I think might be neat here is to trap something in the center point. Now, of course, nothing's going to break, but just as a way of having some fun and stress testing this, let's pull this uh, count back to something a little smaller. I'm not sure what's a good number. Yeah, eyeballing it, let's say 18. That's pretty good. And I want something to be trapped. Oh, we need an odd number. So I just want this link vertical. So I'm going to just make a floating link in the middle, just something that we can control. So keeping this really simple, I'm going to steal one of our cubes. So one of our nice prepared, actually not that one, because that one's long. Let's grab cube one, copy, paste, brand new cube, make it visible. And there's a uh, reset PSR, zeroed out. So it should just be floating there. We can even grab our static link and the cloner and scoot this way over. So it's going to be off to the side. So with a single link right there, that's essentially the same as all these other chains. I'm going to create a cloner, put it inside, set the cloner to radial. So we get this radial, lay it flat on the ground, which it is, and decide how big you want your ring to be. We'll say right about that. And we can make as many copies as we need to say something like that. And now we've got a very simple dynamic object. Well, uh, it's a very simple object that we can do anything we want with. In this case, let's make it dynamic. In fact, I, can we just steal, I'm going to just steal this dynamics tag off of our static link. And it should have all the settings we need, except we just have to turn it back on to being dynamic because it's still a compound collision shape and they're all made out of ellipsoids. So I think that should automatically work. It is going to be dynamic. So I can grab this, scoot it over just so that's intersecting. And what's hopefully going to happen is that will fall to the ground and it's through the link working very nicely. But like I said, we want to stress test this thing. So here's the thought. What if we make a new null and this null is going to be sort of a pivot point for us. So if I were to put that right there, that can become an entire chain. So I'll rename that chain. Put in our cloner links and put in our static link. So now we've got all of that stuff combined. Maybe it would be a nice idea to colorize these a little bit. So this middle ring will be something pretty straightforward, just a green color that will be moving. I'll make another one. This one will be red, and red will represent our static link. So those are the ones that aren't going anywhere. And finally, we can make a, I guess we can make a metallic color. So turn that off. Let's go into reflectance, remove, add a GGX, no specular, make it nice and shiny, blur it out a little bit. Now that could be a nice shiny chain. Drop that onto that. And now we've kind of got, you know, they're just distinguishing themselves a little bit better we can easily tell the difference between them and understand how they're structured. So this is a single chain and that can connect to it. But if we make another cloner, name this one cloner chain, and this one probably name it center ring, just to once again, stay organized. Let's drop our entire chain into the cloner chain. It's gonna make a bunch of copies. In this case, I wanna make them radial. Let's make four to start out with. And I want to control the radius, but you can see the rotation isn't quite what I want. So I'm going to change the transform H. Yeah, H, you can see we can spin that 90, negative 90, technically. I, don't, I didn't know what orientation, just test it until you get it correct. Negative 90, and now they are now 
having the correct orientation. And now I can just change this radius and make sure that they are pivoting correctly from that spot without me, once again, because we're not doing, we're not breaking anything. We can, we don't have to make anything editable and we can just hit play and all of those are running and we've got a dynamic chain that's linked. They're all interlinked and it's running really well. Like that's pretty great. It's really fun to be able to play with this type of stuff. Uh, it just opens up a lot of opportunities. You can tinker around with this a lot. Keeping this rig as simple and clean as this is, you easily have the ability to change the count of how many rings that there are, and it'll automatically update and just make as many of those as you need. We could offset or create more or less clones. And then because we pivoted it right from that center point, right from the beginning of that one particular starting chain, I can create a random effector and let's not randomly affect the position, but instead the rotation. If we do the correct orientation, well, yeah, all of these will be pivoting from the right spot. But just for fun, if we find the right one, which is in this case, in this case B, I could rotate these all randomly up and down and whatnot. So we can play, and it's going to be suspended from all these chains at all these different angles. So there's just a lot of fun to be had making something like this really quickly. Um, let's see. I'm thinking this shadow is a little strong. So I'll just pull back on that, 75%. Yeah, a little taking the edge off that goes a long way. And honestly, I don't even know if we, I don't think we need the floor anymore. So delete the floor, floating in space. And yeah, that's going to be floating. We can create as many copies as we want. It's running really well in the viewport. And we did crank up our steps per frame a decent amount. You could drop it, but at a certain point, I think it will. they will slip through. Yeah, you see that they all snap and they fall apart. Now, this is breaking, but of course, none of those links are breaking. But depending on what you're doing, maybe you don't need to worry about that. Now we have very fast calculating chains, really accurate with good geometry. And we don't have to worry about all the extra details. But of course, we can leave this as high as we want. Back to 25, it should be pretty stable. And what's neat is this center ring is also a dynamic object. So just as a thing I've been doing a lot for testing is we could throw in this center ring. In fact, I'm going to move it to the top of the hierarchy just so I can control it a little bit better. Uh, let's make it uh, move around a little bit. Currently, it's just full-on dynamic, but uh, because it is just full-on dynamic, we can right-click and say Animation Vibrate Tag. And if we give this some animated position and rotation, let's see, how far should we go? How big is this? I'm going to create a cube. Yeah, so about 200 is a good number. This can travel 200 by 200 by 200. If I have play, I don't think really, oh, actually there's something you gotta be careful of is at the beginning, it's already animated in some weird position. So we need it to not be animated up to the strength right away. So I'm gonna go up to, I don't know, let's say frame 45 and keyframe our amplitude, rewind all the way, and we can reset all those to zero, zero, zero and record that. So now it's gonna transition into that more powerful one. And if we hit reset PSR, that should be zeroed out and it will, now transition into having that uh, amplitude, but it's still a dynamic object. So it doesn't care what a vibrate tag says, but it will if we give it some force. So under the force tab in dynamics on the center ring, I can say, I want this to follow by quite a bit. I'm gonna say like 25. So now you can see that it suddenly comes alive. It's trying to yank the chains all over the place. I think we need more frames. Jump it up to 999 crank this up and you can see this wiggling and shaking and trying to fight its way through and because it's so accurate and these chains are so well built it's not able to escape and it's running it's running pretty well we're about uh, even with this, this many steps per frame and this many links it's running pretty well um you have a lot more you can do i mean it's really cool that the chains are actually holding it in there and if we let it yank hard enough i think it could still potentially break it but i just want to throw out there these kind of fun different things we do with making different chains different ways of laying them out linking them to different things in fact should we do that here oh yeah why not just because I'm having fun. And we'll wrap this part up and do a part two where we make the breaking chain. But let's say I, I like this one and I'll save the scene file because it's a good place to come back to. However, I want to continue not with the center ring as much as I like the center ring. I'm going to turn it off. Hold down control as I make it. And let's make all these get linked into a sphere. So we'll make a nice big heavy sphere here in the center point. And actually I'll even make it a little bit bigger. Make it a little larger, 32. And now we can increase the radius of our chain until those are just on the outside of it. And we need these to somehow get 
you know, merged. It wants to hold on to them somehow. So how would we do that? Well, uh, temporarily, let's turn off our chain and we can just look at a single instance of this and maybe scoot that over so it's visually in approximately the same spot that our clone version of it would be. So um, if we may, we have a static link right now and that's working nicely. We could just put the ring, I, I can think of a couple different ways of doing it actually. So one would be, we could just steal out a copy of the static link and move it with the sphere. And then I think if we just tell, if I just move this dynamics tag up to the sphere and move this static one until it's colliding with it, I think that that just becomes a part of it. Now, we don't actually want the sphere to be static, so it will become, again, a moving mesh. It'll be dynamics, dynamic on. And now hopefully if we hit play, I didn't really test this, but... Uh, Actually, yeah, right away, that seems to be working. We just need more steps per frame. Or the sphere is really big and heavy. So you can see immediately it's snapping our chain, bink, which is, once again, great if, if you don't mind the links not actually looking like they break. But if we crank up our steps per frame, I'm not sure how far, let's say 55. Is that enough to hold on to it? Yep. They, oh, almost. It still escaped. So we can jump it up a little bit higher, 77. And there we go. Now it's enough to hold on to it. And it's swinging and it's smooth and everything. I mean, it's just working really well. Like that's pretty fun. It's a clean way of, of combining everything and it's just automatically linked onto it. We could create as many of those as we want to. And I guess the quick way of doing this would be to create a second cloner. So I can create, uh, we have the cloner chain, which is going to loop a bunch of them around, but only one of them actually has a like a hook to latch onto. So if we create a copy of our overall chain, the entire thing, delete the contents and just feed in that new static link, then it's going to create a bunch of copies of it around and really easy now to just change the radius of that a little bit, grab the transform, spin it on 90. There we go. Now there are oh, as many of those made here as there are on the overall object. So hitting play on that, we did crank up the steps for frame. I don't think they have to be as high. I'm gonna drop it to 25 again because now there's more chains holding it, but it still might break. So let's see. Yeah, it broke all of them. But let me show you another trick. Instead of making that, instead of cranking up and up and up and up the steps per frame, right now this sphere is very heavy. And if you want it to be that heavy, then hey, great, it's working. But, um, and also what well, I'm thinking about, let's make this green because that is moving. But we don't want the sphere to be as heavy. So we can just click on the spheres dynamic tag say mass and give it a custom density one is default but it's really big and it's relative to the object so because it's so big and fat it's going to be really heavy compared to everything else so we drop this to point one it's where it's weighing one tenth of what it currently is and at a weight of one tenth i think it's not going to be strong enough to yank those apart so we didn't need to crank up the steps per frame we just needed to make it light enough that it didn't it didn't exert so much force on everything around it uh, something that's cool is we can copy everything from the center ring over so I could steal this vibrate tag. And if we make this sphere object also follow position, let's say 25. Whoa, okay, 25 is really strong apparently. Also, let's make sure that this is at zeroed out. Yeah, so 25 is maybe a lot. Let's let that float around. Yeah, it's just kind of yanking everything. So let's go easy on that follow position. It's still pretty heavy. There we go. So yeah, follow position is still yanking around. You see it's come to life and it's trying to keep everything going. So it's nice and trapped and it's a fun uh, a fun detail. And just, you know, these rigs can get really interesting and fun to play around with. But keep in mind that density. Keep in mind your steps per frame. Oh, and it finally did kind of break through there. So a nice additional detail on that if you want that to happen. So pretty fun. The placement of those, they, we can still turn on the random and those will rotate. And still, they're still connected to those rings. Ooh, uh, this chain link actually has the effector in it. We'll delete that. So those will not move, but these will spin around. And they're still linked to those, but they're pivoting from different spots. So these will still be trapped and can pull them around from there. So yeah, lots of, lots of fun things to do just playing with this simpler version of these links where we get just have nice clean geometry. And it's a pretty simple setup. So I'm going to leave this here for part one be sure to check out part two where we are going to spend a bunch of time trying to get plastic deformation on individual links of a chain so that it will actually bend out and maintain its shape when it's broken that concludes 
part one of this follow-up to the breaking chain tutorial, be sure to check out part two. It should be released at the exact same time, so you should be able to see the link below to continue into the breaking part of the chains. Hopefully you see that this is a cleaner, faster setup to what we had before. It's pretty versatile. Uh, we didn't have to crank up the steps per frame so much, and everything just runs really nice and cleanly. No baking, no making editable, at least not in this part. And in in once we're in the breaking, there's still things we need to do. But I'm really excited about the deformation part of these. But that will wrap up this one. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like or a comment. If you make something cool, let me know. If you have suggestions or you want to see anything, then you can always leave comments. Come check out the live streams on Wednesdays. And of course, there is Patreon if you would like to support the things I'm doing. If this was helpful, if you use this for a project or for a client, uh, any, any support is appreciated, but not necessary. As you can see, these tutorials are coming out we're at this point weekly for free for everyone. So it's appreciated, but not necessary. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next part. Bye bye. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I don't think I am.